The RBA is set to hold the cash rate later today, but with a hawkish tinge. And overnight, the US dollar was strong as US interest rates keep rising away from the others, especially in Asia. That's coming up in our five things in five minutes. And in our bonus deep dive, we go behind the surge in India's economic momentum as it hosts G20 leaders later this week. When you're compounding growth at 5, 6 or 7% in real terms and doing that year after year, I think India will get to Japan's level of GDP in the not too distant future. But first, in 5 and 5 with ANZ, number one. ANZ's Head of Australian Economics, Adam Boyton, expects the RBA to hold the cash rate early this afternoon Australian time, but with a hawkish tinge. This extended pause or this another month of pausing will come with a reminder that uh, monetary policy may still need to be tightened further. So expect that sort of language in the statement. And it's quite possible that the bank, in framing that and in, in talking about some of the challenges and some of the reasons why monetary policy may still need to be tightened, focus on the stickiness we're seeing in non-tradables inflation uh, that we saw in the monthly CPI last week. Number two, Adam also thinks the Reserve Bank will hold off on any talk about an acceleration of its quantitative tightening. That's the unwinding of its bond buying that it did during COVID. We don't think that they'll they'll move to quantitative tightening either at this meeting or, or at subsequent meetings, but it's possible that the board will turn its attention to that. Certainly, there's been discussion, or the RBA have in the past few months, there's been a speech around the bank's balance sheet. So, look, it's these are the sorts of things that, that I think will come up at some point uh, in board meetings, but we're not expecting the bank to engage in quantitative tightening or to announce uh, the start of quantitative tightening in this meeting. Number three, the US dollar remains strong this morning against Asian currencies in particular, as the interest rate differential continues to widen in favour of the global reserve currency. Here's ANZ's head of FX research, Marjabin Zaman. Growth pressures outside the U.S. have been uh, weakening. Uh, PMIs in Europe, as we saw in the last few weeks, have been indicating a manufacturing recession for some time. Now we also see the PMI services sub-index now contracting. So clearly, uh, euro area households are now feeling the impact of those higher interest rates. Uh, And also we think that probably the ECB will likely pause at their next meeting. Not forgetting China. China activity data continues to disappoint We have seen surprise uh, moves from the PBOC to cut interest rates. So this has widened the U.S.-China yield differential. And I think all of these factors have played into U.S. exceptionalism in the recent weeks. Number four, Australian profits and inventories numbers yesterday have taken the shine off GDP forecasts for the June quarter. Profits, they were down 13.1%, and real inventories fell 1.9%. Both of them were surprisingly weak. That full GDP number is due on Wednesday. We've got a couple more details to come. Here's Adam again on what yesterday's numbers meant. So we're expecting GDP growth to be 0.2 for Q2, but what these numbers do do is present a bit of a downside risk to that forecast. However, we've got some more data coming out today, in particular net exports uh, and, quite importantly, government spending data. And so once we've received all of that data today, uh, we'll we'll issue a final GDP forecast. But at the moment, uh, in the wake of yesterday's business indicators, 0.2 with some downside risk. Number five, there's plenty of traders on the lookout this morning for intervention by the Bank of Japan and the People's Bank of China to prop up their currencies due to all this US dollar strength. But another one to watch is the Reserve Bank of India. Here's Marjabin again on how the RBI is putting a floor under the rupee. There has been a shift in the way it manages their currency. And we believe now, you know, it's being used as a policy tool to support growth and stabilize inflation by, you know, keeping the INR stable and competitive. The RBI has accumulated FX reserves of well over 600 billion, and that's the fourth largest in the world. So it really gives them the ability now to prevent the rupee from weakening too far beyond that 83 mark. ANZ's head of FX research, Marjabin Zaman there. Now it's time for our bonus deep dive interview with ANZ's Group Chief Economist, Richard Yetzinger. He explains why India's moment on the global economic stage has arrived as it gears up 
to host the G20 Leaders Summit this weekend. The shift in the structure of the Indian economy, the, the cumulative impact of policy reform has been quite remarkable. Um, the goods and services tax, for instance, has harmonised a lot of state taxes, reduced the barriers to transport across this enormous continent, reduced the headwinds to business, um, made it much easier for businesses to operate border to border. Things like the infrastructure spend, which from one year to the next you don't necessarily notice, but I challenge anybody who visits India after the pandemic and who hasn't been since before the pandemic not to talk about how remarkable this infrastructure shift has been and how much you can see uh, with the naked eye the sort of activity that's contributing to improved rail infrastructure, road infrastructure, you know, other sort of logistical-related building. And then there are things which have accumulated over a long period of time, like the national highway system. Over the 10 years to 22, 23, for instance, the highway system is is about 50% larger than it was a decade before that. You're seeing that in economic performance and you're seeing that in India's aspiration. And we're seeing some of the uh, changes towards electrification in its economy and a change in its... um, in its urban transport, which uh, seems to be driving a lot of activity as well. It's reached a critical threshold such that you can clearly see the impacts. Um, It's become a much more important marginal player in commodity markets, not just because of the electrification process, as you point out, Bernard, but just because it's reaching much more critical mass. And let's remember, India is at not a dissimilar stage of development to China about 20 years ago, in fact, a little bit further, but let's call it 20 or 25 years between friends. And if you remember, China then had only just started to be the marginal driver of commodity pricing, be the marginal driver of commodity supply. And so you're starting to see that in India. Of course, in India, this is occurring in a very different global environment. And that's part of this refocusing attention on India as well. It's not just about what India has done, but the fact that global investment is in flux, global foreign direct investment is in flux, global trading relationships. A different lens is used these days, much less multilateral, much more bilateral. All of these shifts, India is naturally attaching its, its you know, fair share of attention as businesses and investors and governments look around the world as they keep recalibrating some of these things. China's uh, growth is slowing down. Could India uh, and its growth be enough to pick up the slack created by China's relative slowdown? No, not today and, and, and not tomorrow. On some measures, China accounts for about a third of global GDP growth. It's an $18 trillion economy. India, in rough terms, is a $4 trillion economy. Um, India would have to grow at more than 20% a year. <laughs> To, to directly replace what we might lose from China over the next few years. But India is becoming more important as it becomes larger. A big part of China's growth over the last 20 years was its uh, increasing engagement with the rest of the world. Do you think India can be a lot more connected and uh, involved in the global economy in the same way? China has been very involved and remains very involved. It's still the world's largest trading nation. It's still an active participant in many many global fora. And I think in many ways, India is still building up to that. It's India which is liberalising and which is allowing more international interest in its domestic economy in some sectors that have been protected previously. Well, there's this natural disposition to compare these two Asian giants with populations that are more than a billion people I think we forget that China had to grow into its economy through its diplomatic relationships, and India, in fact, is doing the same. ANZ's Group Chief Economist, Richard Yetzinger there. I'm Bernard Hickey. That was 5 and 5 with ANZ for Tuesday, September the 5th. Catch you tomorrow with all the detail from the RBA's decision and a look ahead to Australian GDP figures on Wednesday. This podcast was recorded for publication on behalf of ANZ. All associated disclosures and disclaimers can be viewed using the link in your media player or the ANZ website through which you access this podcast. All care has been taken to report the views of ANZ Research in the creation of this podcast, but as an independent host, any differing interpretations are strictly mine and not ANZ's. Feel free to contact your ANZ point of contact with any questions.